Arsenal versus Liverpool at the Emirates for the second time in the span of a month. And of course, Liverpool have got one win this season against Arsenal. And then, of course, one draw against Arsenal. Can Arsenal equal out the scales? Well, last season's result would actually indicate so. The 3-2 at home at the Emirates when Arsenal were obviously a much better team than Liverpool made the difference last year in terms of the two sides and differentiating between the two of them. But will it be the same this year? There are different vibes around for Liverpool. There are slightly different vibes around for Arsenal. Liverpool go into this as one of the form teams, if not the form team, in the league. And Obviously, with everything that's going on around the club at the moment, I think there is a lot to unpack about the emotional balance of what is going on. I think before we get into anything, I'd love to extend our honest best wishes to Conor Bradley and his family at this point. I don't think there's much more that needs to be said about that right now, but it's obviously one of the most tragic things that can happen in anyone's life. And you always wish anyone who's dealing with that kind of thing all the best. Uh, I don't think we need to say any more at this point. And obviously, I won't be including any of the analysis of what he's done so far this season or is going to do in the future of his career in this video. I think it's just a time to respect people as a human. But on, on, on the game, I think there's a really interesting balance here. And what makes this game kind of interesting to watch, there's a lot of previews on this game on YouTube, not least obviously this one. But watching Arsenal fans previews, watching Liverpool fans previews, what I find really interesting is no one's really talking about the X factors or the variables within this game, because guess what? There have been so many X factors and variables over the last two or three seasons, even over the last 12 games when Arsenal have been struggling for a result against Liverpool. Klopp has varied things. Klopp's rolled different dice. Klopp's put players in different positions. Klopp's made average positions for certain players almost completely change. And it seems like, again, he's going to have to do that versus Arsenal. Obviously, uh, Darwin Nunes looks like a doubt. Trent, I think, might come back in just purely because of the personnel issue that Liverpool have back there. Andy Robertson, I don't think, will come back in in this game. I think bringing back two fullbacks in this game in the same way probably won't work. But, you know, Jurgen Klopp, prove me wrong. I love Andy Robertson. I'd love him in the team. But Joe Gomez in that last game, up against Saka, there was a lot of one-on-ones. Uh, that was in the FA Cup. That was the 2-0 away from home for Liverpool, where the average positions look very much like that. It, it was interesting to see. Because there was kind of a thing that Arteta, I guess I have accused Arteta of doing recently, where basically Arteta has this idea in his mind that these attacks will in the end work if you keep doing them. It happened at Anfield last season with the 2-2, another game that I was at. And it happened with the 2-0 against Liverpool, another game that I was at, where over and over again, they kept attacking the same elements of Liverpool's defence, maybe believing that those are the weak areas. Last season, it was just going down that Virgil van Dijk channel over and over and over again. And Virgil was just heading it away very consistently after Liverpool's shaky early moments. And Arsenal suddenly stopped plumbing or like going down the areas that they were meant to and almost changed the game plan to an unreasonable level with almost no need to. If they'd have just continued, they would have absolutely killed Liverpool on that day. But Liverpool came back into it. Anfield brought them back into it and obviously made a massive difference to our belief and to their season. Fast forward a little bit. The one-all. I think Arsenal fans, the way that they're trying to build this game up, and I think rightly so, they've spoken about the fact that Arsenal have missed a lot of opportunities. They've even used Jurgen Klopp's own quotes about those games to prove how in the game Arsenal were. I mean, in that one-all, I, I think the XG for both teams was about one. It was a very difficult game to differentiate between the two. Both teams had a lot of shots. Were the quality of shots all that good? Probably not. W were they fast enough when they needed to be? No. Were they in the right position when they needed to be? No. Obviously, there was there was a Mo Salah chance, and I think it was uh, they, they scored one from like a set piece fairly early on, actually. And really, for the rest of the game, it's very hard to differentiate between the two. But the point being, Arsenal had a lot of opportunities in that game. And if you go back and look at those opportunities, you don't really feel that there was anything where you kind of go, OK, that was a game winning moment, which is what I think Liverpool probably did have in the second half against Arsenal in that one all. There's the Trent opportunity. Um, there's a lot of times where you think the counter is on for Liverpool. Broadly, they did actually have a really good second half of football, although Arsenal settled into it. I think Liverpool were always in the ascendancy in that second half or more uh, dominant in the second half more often than Arsenal actually were. You know, we can we can debate whether they were or not. But I think broadly, Liverpool were the better team overall in that game. One all seemed like a fair result to come away with, though. In the 2-0, I think this is where we can differentiate between the two sides, right? In the 2-0, 
It's not about, hey, we had some great opportunities. We got into this position, we got into that position. It's the specific personnel for both sides that make a massive difference. And what I mean by that is, for instance, you know, I don't know if XG takes this into account, but Alisson, a huge player. Canate, huge player. And I mean, in terms of actual stature, actual size, those people running at you, they are massive. They close angles very quickly just because of their side. Virgil, the same. I think that's really fascinating to look at. They talk about, oh, we had the whole goal open up. I was watching, like, if you're watching from where we were watching, the actual amount of space that Arsenal had to look at within that goal, it's quite small. Because Liverpool place players when they get back into those positions and Arsenal try and work it into kind of the edge of the box area, similar to what Chelsea did in the last game when they were trying to make opportunities, similar to the areas they try to overload Liverpool in, similar to what Virgil van Dijk got sucked into a couple of times in this game, in the game against Chelsea in the last game. Those kind of things, they work the ball back to like the edge of the box and then try and get something. It's not to say these aren't good quality opportunities, it's not to say they're not making decent chances, but against Liverpool, what you're what you're doing is not playing into their hands. It's the best of a poor bunch of opportunities that you can create. Almost the same against Arsenal, the other end. They're going to limit a huge amount of your opportunities because guess what? Declan Rice is sitting in front of that. He's probably the best anticipator of play in the whole league. I think Liverpool as a collective are very good at dealing with anticipating where the opposition is going to go. But individually, you've got to give Declan Rice, uh, especially in midfield, his kudos. Like, give him his dues. This guy is amazing at anticipating play. And then the two defenders behind it, and obviously, you know, it's either Kivio or Zinchenko on one side and probably Ben White on the other. But, you know, in this game, I think they're probably going to end up going for uh, Zinchenko because Kivio in that last game didn't have a particularly good game. Didn't particularly enjoy a good game uh, against Liverpool, at least. I do think he's still a decent player. And then on the other side, I think we probably are going to see a White or someone like that. It, it just makes sense. Uh, they probably need someone a bit more solo over there. And then I'm not actually quite sure who they're going to come up against. Will it be Jota? Will it be Diaz? Will it be Cody Gakpo? Nunes, is he a possibility? Is he going to be on the bench for this game? This is where these X factors, the roll of the dice from Klopp made all the difference. The people in those positions specifically made the difference. It wasn't about controlling the game. Uh, Liverpool worked their way into it through Trent in that last game moving into midfield, just spraying the ball out to Darwin Nunez time after time, or just those nice little passes that he just gets a bit of rhythm going as to, it's not even about like, hey, side to side, it's actually about let's get some rhythm of just the ball coming at you over and over again. It feels like a ball hitting the wall sometimes, and in the end he kind of like slices it through. It's kind of like a game of tennis almost, like Trent like puts it to you, you put it back. Trent like then puts it back down. There's a slice in there somewhere. It's really, there's a technique and like a constant nature to it, which feels more like a rally between Liverpool and Arsenal in that last game. Anyway, that then there's that X factor in midfield. Canate was more than able to deal with that in the last game. I think we're going to see a combo of Canate and Virgil van Dijk in this one. Joe Gomez over on the far side because I think he's suited this system really well so far. And then we're going to see Trent slipping inside in the midfield, similar to that last game. And Broadly, I think what we're going to see is McAllister, Curtis Jones to try and get that, get that control in midfield. Probably Sobersly. But I wonder if they'll play Sobersly and Cody Hakpo because I think Sobersly might end up getting pushed. I think Harvey Elliott in this game probably isn't... I don't, I don't think he's a bad choice, but I just think if you've got Sobersly in there, I think there's that Salah factor that if we play Cody Gakpo, we can rotate Sobersly and Gakpo just a little bit more. And then if you want to change the game up, you've got that game-changing Harvey Elliott nature. Uh, you've probably got Nunez to come on. I don't know. We, there's got to be someone on the bench who's got to come off the bench. That's probably Gravenberg. That's probably Elliott. That's probably a Nunez in this game because you might start with Hakpo. Even if you might do it the other way around because of Curtis's quote about him being the ghost where he comes in and kind of makes a big difference, almost completely unacknowledged, not only by the fans, but also by some of the players on the field. It's like he kind of ghosts in. It's like just appears. That is, it's a really great nickname, by the way, for, uh, for Gakpo. And I think you'll probably see a front, starting front line of Diaz, Jota, Gakpo or Diaz, Jota, Nunes. Probably Gakpo. And that probably means that you will see Hakpo out on the right to protect that Trent side with Sobberslide just behind him or Sobberslide just on the outside of that, looking to kind of get in that Connor Bradley-esque or Frimpong-esque area to like just attack at that left back area, really like 
pin them back on that side, make Zinchenko think, don't let them out, don't allow them to get that extra body into the midfield, allow Curtis Jones and McAllister that control in that central area, or at least try it because controlling against Rice is very hard. And then Jota, allow him a much more free roll. But Diaz, allow him to come a bit more centrally. I actually like Diaz a bit more centrally when he's kind of, he's able to drift over to the right, he's able to drift over there. Sometimes he gets it, moves it, moves out to that area. I love it. Like it works so well for Liverpool. It's not that he's playing as a 10, but he's kind of waiting for the ball in an area and like moving out to the left, moving out to the right. Being able to like move Arsenal around like that is exactly how Liverpool are going to be able to create opportunities in this game because Arsenal are hard to move around. And we, we need to suck them into a game here. We need to suck them into the back and forth. We need to suck them into that like you punch, we punch kind of thing. It's at the Emirates. They'll have taken a lot from the last game when they played in there, all white for the anti-knife crime and we played in our purple. I don't get why, I suppose we shouldn't play in our red because they're playing in their red for the blood uh, of the people who uh, have passed away or blood of people who spilt. So maybe we shouldn't play in red for that, but I think they'll play in that. We'll play in our green and white in this. But you get what I'm saying? There's like a, there's a back and a fourth and a, that Liverpool and Arsenal have. Liverpool need to capitalise on that. It's the people keep underestimating Liverpool, right? It's the unpredictable nature of what these formations can do, where it is like, ah, why are we like, why are you underestimating what Klopp is capable of there? Why are you underestimating what this side is capable of in terms of just hitting you on the opposite, uh, hitting you on the counter? I don't think Arteta underestimates it. I think fans previewing it do. I think other people look at Jota and go, oh, well, he's a good finisher, it's a purple patch or whatever it is. Sure, I mean, I get that. But without Salah in the side, Liverpool are a much more unpredictable team because you don't know, you know, Liverpool relied on him for quite a while. They're predictable in a different way, shall I say. I think they're very unpredictable with him in it, but I think they're predictable in a different way. And then finally, I also think without Nunez in the side, without the assists, without the goals, we're going to have to move them around a little bit more. There isn't that chaos element or actually what we mean is, as I loved, I heard it the other day, he's almost like a jazz player. It's like, where is he going to go? How is he going to go? Who's going to riff with him? Who's going to be the person who like works with this guy to make the saxophone work in this song or make the piano work in this song and bam, suddenly, right, there's like a rhythm and a riff where it's like, ah, he's found that position. Let's play to that strength. So I think we're not going to have that as much in this game, just purely out of uh, injuries, just purely out of uh, like just sheer necessity. And I reckon we might save him as a bit of an impact player later in the game, someone who can either make it a little bit harder to play, so make it go long and kind of stretch them out, or go the other way, and if we need that late attacking impetus, keep a Gakpo in, bring Nunes in, and just, that there's a great combo there that we can kind of capitalize on. So the midfield, McAllister has been particularly good over the last few games, I'm gonna be really interested. It, you know, I say really good, he's come up against some particularly weak midfields more recently, or particularly like, midfields that are better for him to control. He's had some eight, nine out of 10 performances. This is going to be a real challenge. I don't think Partey comes back in for them. I think being against Odegaard, being against uh, Rice and being against whoever their final guy is. It was Kai Havertz in one of the other games because they didn't have Gabriel Jesus. I think coming up against the Gabriel Jesus, very different to coming up against Kai Havertz. I think if they come up against Gabriel Jesus, there's real movement in there. That's where they're probably going to need like a Curtis Jones a little bit deeper. They're probably going to need a Soboslai just to kind of foul him, get out there. And that's probably why they put a Gakpo like out or a Jota like out and then Gakpo in the set. Like there's so many different combos. That's what makes Liverpool so difficult to predict and preview. But also it's great because you can just say, this guy be over there. This guy be over there sometimes. Diaz might drift out that way and Gakpo might drift out that way. That's what Liverpool love to do. It makes it hard to... Uh, defend against, first of all, but it also makes it much better to, to for them as a defensive team. You don't know where players are. There's a quick counter-attack. There's a break. Trent can get forward if he wants to, like in the last game, and kind of see what we can do in the counter-attack. We almost had too many options there because, hey, who knows where Liverpool are going to be next. And, um, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. I, it's very sad that Conor Bradley can't play in this game, and obviously we understand completely why. He's been on a great run of form recently, particularly when you look at his heat map from the last game. It was really front-footed from Liverpool, and rightly so, like we were completely on the front foot almost for the whole game against Chelsea. You want to build on that. This is really crunch. And I think that I'll finish on this kind of thought about, you know, I didn't want to talk about Klopp leaving, but, you know, this is kind of one of those final big games for Klopp. In the last run, you're going to highlight it as, cool, like, this is, if you're going to motivate the players, this is the game you can do it. And this is one of three or four you know, like temple games that Sky and everyone else will be shown on the weekend. It, I think what we'll see is an element of how the players are going to approach those big games under Klopp. 
We'll see maybe a preview of how they'll feel in the cup final, whether you can get under their skin. There was almost this offensive Norwich type thing when Norwich scored, it was a bit like, hey, you don't get what's going on here. Like he's leaving. So I feel like Arsenal are gonna to wanna to upset that party. They see themselves like Arteta is equal to Klopp. Arteta is their version of Klopp. You know, he loves us, we love him. Like we're gonna really upset you. We don't like that in the recent years, you've become the sweethearts of the Premier League. We're gonna take that back as Arsenal. Do you get what I mean? So let's see. I'll be really interested to see how Arsenal play it. I'll be really interested to see how the Emirates play it. It's not something, I, you know, it's not a particularly respectful stadium towards Liverpool because of the way we've treated Arteta or the Liverpool bench treated Arteta more recently, but also just because they want that mantle. And rightly so, by the way. Don't think this is not out of disrespect. I just think it's out of, you don't want to be too respectful in those moments. It's going to be fun. I'm not going to the game. Not not going to not manage to get a ticket. If anyone out there has got a ticket, let me know. If you've got any spares, I'm literally like here. The stadium is there. Um, but yeah, let me know. I'd love to chat to you guys. I'll see in the comments. We've got a Discord. We've got a Patreon, and I'll chat to you guys again real soon, right here. Lawrence McKenna. Much love. Bye.